You mean the black edges? The the box that was showing up. No, I don't see it now. It's okay. not there now. No, I just clicked on it and then it went away. Oh, well, thank you, Lindy. So <laughs> maybe that's what we need to do. Anyway, <laughs> okay. welcome right. again to Techniques in Art today. Um, you know, every time y'all come up with questions, I can't quite know the answer to. So let's follow up to those questions. Someone asked me about oil, the weight of oil paint and slippage. Yes, I asked my friend who not only is a, a talented um, artist or professional artist herself, but she also teaches. And she said that oil paint does indeed have weight. And if you're going to be applying a great deal, canvas may not be your best choice. You may want to put it on a panel painting. The main reason for slippage of paint is, as we guessed, um, impatience. She said it's that artist doesn't wait long enough to um, apply um, the um, the over paint, you know, so you have to let it dry and it takes a while for, for oil paint to dry. She said she had one patient who kept losing his work and losing his work and losing his work. And finally, she tried everything she could think of. And then finally, she just sat with him and she watched. And what he was trying to do was use an air dryer, a blow dryer to hurry up the oil drying. And it, that doesn't work. Let's just put it that way. So the other thing I wanted to get into, because someone brought up the, the, the massive press. We were talking about the massive fresco of um, the School of Athens. And keep in mind, that is, there is a, a subject that size on every wall of that room, therefore um, dedicated to different things. And that's the philosophy wall. So artists, obviously an individual artist couldn't paint all that in a reasonable period of time. So what they would do is, and this was how you got educated, at about 12 to 14 years of age, your parents would make a contract, pay a fee between the artist and the guild would be involved. Um, and you would serve between one and eight years, depending on your talent and uh, progress. You would work up, the second level was journeyman level. Each level meant you had more and more responsibilities. Now, your graduation, when you finally were ready to go out on your own, have a studio of your own, be able to train students, was when the guild and the artist you were training with recognized your work as sufficient to master status. And that meant you created a work, an individual work of your own. It's where the word masterpiece actually comes from. And then you were, it was like your thesis, your PhD. You know, you presented it, the guild and your artist said, yes, this is, you know, talent, you know, he's ready to go out on his own. Once master status was achieved, you were a full guild member, could receive commissions and take on students. One very famous example was Anthony Van Dyke. He was an apprentice to Peter Paul Rubens. And once he completed his work, he continued to work for Rubens independently. He was, he was an independent contractor, we'd say today. He worked in Rubens' studio, uh, worked on many large commissions with Rubens, but he was treated as an equal by Rubens. Um, and then he would then he went out on his own and established his studio. Like Rubens, he would paint for the uh, the royalty of England. So, one advantage to the apprentice system to the artist, in addition to fees was that you could use artists in training for large commissions and such as the School of Athens. And I'm gonna show you Rubens Marie de Medici cycle. There's that silly box again. Um, it's still there. Maybe Lindy can make it go away again. Yeah, thank you. So we're here, not seeing it. You're not seeing it, well, good. I'm seeing it. Thank you, John. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens Marie de Medici cycle. Um, it's now currently in the Louvre. Have any of you seen it? It is, it fills an entire room. Um, and here you can see it. It's complex iconography celebrating the life of Marie de Medici, who was um, the dowager queen of France at that time. Her son was the king. 
Now he worked personally creating the design and on the central and significant figures, concentrating primarily on the face and the hands. The face would almost exclusively be done by Rubens himself. Under his direction, the journeyman and the apprentice would do the less important areas. Um, you know, they would, you know, maybe do the flesh. He, he'd have the figures, you know, remember he'd have the figures outlined on the canvas and they would fill in areas. And then of course he was supervising all of it and going back and making sure it was part of his job as a teacher. You know, that how do you learn to do something if you don't actually get to work at it. Um, I will say this was a complicated um, commission because creating uh, 24 paintings that are life-size that celebrate Marie de Medici uh, wasn't the easiest uh, commission because she didn't really have that much of a life. She didn't do a lot of things in her life to be celebrated. She was um, something of a tyrant to her family for sure. However, she was a powerful woman, and it is testimony to Rubens that late in his career, she wanted to speak with him, and he just, nope, not gonna. He was not going to go to her. And Peter Paul Rubens had such status that the Dowager Queen of France came to him, and that didn't happen very often. So this, having a studio, training students, it allowed you to make these large, enormous works. And, you know, he had control of everything. You know, if you made a mistake, you painted a figure awkwardly or you painted it, you did a wrong color, wrong um, shading, he would come back, correct it, probably teaching you. He was, he was very well respected as a teacher. Um, Peter Paul Rubens was was a very um, known to be a very, he was very much interested in peace. He went to England hoping to negotiate an end to the 80 years war. Um, he was not successful. He never saw peace in his lifetime, but he worked very hard trying to achieve peace because he saw the damage it caused to his homeland. So we're gonna talk about today's topic that finishes up painting, unless there's any questions. Um, we're gonna talk about printmaking. And printmaking is an interesting subject, I believe. Um, the things you need to know about prints is that they are, they have, they are very different from other works of art we've looked at so far. The artist, for one, does not draw on or paint directly on the surface. He creates a surface that makes the art. Um, prints can be reproduced, creating multiple images that are almost identical. This would cause a great deal of controversy. For example, the Royal Academy in London didn't want to admit printmakers at first because you know you can reproduce your work if you've got a mechanical element to it. Well, you know, um, I don't know about that. The image that is created on the paper is the reverse of the image created on the plate, wood block, or lithography stone. And the plate, wood block, or lithography stone is where the original image is created. And I, I thought I had an example for you, but I don't. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Um, but so think about that. When they're working on the plate, they're making and they want their figure to face to the right, they have to draw the figure facing to the left because it will be reversed when they print. So there are four basic print methods. Relief and the raised area in relief holds the ink. In taglio, the incised area holds the relief. Lithography, the image, um, that holds the the image area holds ink, non non image area repels ink, and we'll talk in detail about each of these. But let's just quickly go through them. And screen printing, where the paint goes through, creates the image. So um, relief is described uh, describes any method in which the image is raised from the background. Excellent example that everyone's familiar with is a rubber stamp. 
Any surface that can be carved is suitable for relief printing. Stone and wood are commonly used. Stone provide, provides a very durable surface, but difficult to carve. Wood easier to carve, but the images can wear down. And um, you can tell, I mean, experts in prints can tell often if it is, you know, several hundred images have been made from a wood block because the, there is a change in the um, appearance in the lines. But the first wood woodcuts were made um, by the Chinese and uh, paper as well. And they invented this process. And, and um, you can see it in this ninth century scroll. It's the preface to the Diamond Sutra. Sutra is a, a Buddhist text. It's a woodblock hand scroll. Look at the detail and remember that this has been created in relief. It's been carved facing, you know, that Buddha kind of faces to the right here. He would have been facing to the left in the woodblock. Look at all the detail that would have all been carved. Where you don't want ink to be taken up is where you carve the raised areas take the ink. That's an important distinction with this particular technique. The raised areas take the ink. So the artist draws what he wants on his wood block and then carves away the areas that are not meant to be printed. Here in Europe, wood blocks had been used to print on fabric since the sixth century, but it was not until the mid 15th century when paper became less expensive and easier to obtain. Remember, you know, Marco Polo goes in the 1300s to China and he brings back all sorts of marvelous things, spices, uh, silks, prints, um, and paper. So Albert Durer, brilliant, brilliant printmaker um, and painter. Um, he did a series, um, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Remember, 1500 is a significant year in the Christian calendar because it's a jubilee year. Every 500 years, and uh, we had one in 2000, um, they have a big celebration. There's a lot of ritual and celebrated, but there's also a great deal of anxiety around these Jubilee years because uh, particularly the year 1000, if y'all remember Y2K and you know, our computers were going to crash, everything terrible was going to happen. It's that kind of anxiety, except for the people of, of Europe, they feared the end of the world. They feared the last judgment, the second coming. You know, the book of Revelation, Revelations was going to come to life, which is uh, why, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, notice the date, 1497-98. Durer is printing these. These are for sale. This is a, you know, um, <clears throat> a process. Printmaking was very useful for that. You know, you could make several copies. They were less expensive than an original oil painting or uh, manuscripts, so you could make these and sell them. And uh, people were very curious about what they feared would happen. So um, this is one of his drawings. You can see, um, you know, here's famine here in the front. The um, I didn't set up the laser pointer, sorry. Uh, famine here in the front. You can see the, the starving figure on the horse. The horse's ribs are showing. Um, and they're trampling the world and the angel up above. So this, this was a very fearful image for the people of the time. In Asia, of course, they've been making prints for some time, particularly in China. Um, in the 14th century, the Chinese had developed multiple block, a multiple block technique that allowed them to produce multicolored prints. That technique was transferred to uh, Japan, and, it, and in Japan, they tried, achieved an incredible level of artistry um, and multiple blocks, multiple colors. Um, when Europe discovers them in the um, mid to late 19th century, um, they are just thrilled. 
and amazed by what can be achieved. The color block printmaking in Japan revolves around, again, relief painting and conscious color application. This requires a great deal of thought. You have to think about which color to put down first. Each block is carved specifically per color. So if you're going to put black lines on or you know, a black area, um, let's say a black swan, then you'll draw the swan. But I'm sure the swan is going to have you know, a beak, a different color. All those things you have to think about and you have to think about applying color on top of each other. All prints have what's called a registration mark, which allows them to line it up so that they can make multiple prints, you know, so they're, that they don't get off and then they end up with things not meeting. Um, the Japanese artists used to, their prints were so complicated, having two register marks was, registration marks was quite useful. So they would first draw the image, a thin, durable type of paper, the washi, would then be glued to a block of wood and using the outlines, they would then carve the surface and create the relief. The artist would then apply ink to the relief. But remember, you have each block is specific to the colors. So then a piece of paper, they would transfer the ink to paper and they would create multiple colors and they would simply repeat, repeat the entire process. Um, and using the registration marks to keep everything aligned. So while producing prints was quick and relatively mechanical process, it culminated, however, in rich hues of meticulously hand colored paintings, radiant reds, vivid blues and greens, and even stark blacks are prevalent in the most celebrated wood block prints. Strong, flat compositions, very strong shapes, patterns, bold lines, there isn't a lot of perception of depth, depth, excuse me, not death, depth. Um, whereas uh, artists of, in Europe are very fascinated with the illusion of perspective and creating depth and, and portraying it. The um, Asians are not that interested in it. They look pattern, color, um, and the, they had their subjects were taken from nature uh, women and particularly actors of the Yukio E. I'm sorry, my Japanese is not um, all that good. Someone has raised their hand. Uh, Mr. Williams, Kenneth Williams, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, could these colors, like in watercolor, using the same print block, could they put on like a blue and then perhaps uh, take that same block and put a red over it? create a purple? I'm not sure. Um, my understanding is each block had a separate color. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a printmaker and um, I will find out for you if they do that. I think if you're not using a great variety of colors, perhaps you could do that. But as you'll see, when I show you some examples here on the next page, you'll see how intricate those designs are. Um, it would seem like it's more efficient to mix the color you want and then put it on the block and have yeah. one stamping than to right. use two different colors and have two stampings. Right. It, it, that was the my understanding is, you know, they do want each block has a specific color assigned to it, specific area on the print and, you know, and again, I'm sure they had students and apprentices and, you know, I, I, maybe when you first start out, but when you, some of these artists became very, very famous and their prints were desired, they were sold. The previous picture, um, this is an actor of uh, one of the plays and it would be, um, this was like getting, um, you know, oh, if y'all remember photo play magazine, you know, this was like collecting movie star photographs. You know, this, this was, this man, this actor, particularly in this particular, maybe this was a role he made famous, you know, maybe if you had a picture of Clark Gable as Rhett Butler, you know, that kind of thing, that would have a great deal of appeal to the society and they collected these images. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about, oh, wait a minute, never mind. that's in the next section, I, I digress. So um, 
back to this. So they had this, the an entertainment de district in the 17th century Edo, which is modern day Tokyo, um, a different name, different time. Um, it was inhabited by the ge geisha, the sumo wrestlers, musicians and actors, and the rising middle-class gentlemen and not, not women, uh, but he would go there for his pleasures, his enjoyment. It, go watch a sumo uh, wrestler match. Now, the geisha, there's a wide variety of, there's a class system in it. Um, the Not all of them were prostitutes. However, the majority of them were. I mean, one of the services they sold was sex. However, they were trained, the upper levels were trained in all sorts of music and, and flower arrangement and things that were just posing beautifully, you know. Um, and those were the more expensive girls. But yes, there certainly, there were brothels. Um, this was the floating world. It was an entertainment district. Today, we probably call it the red light district. Um, so here is an example of three prints showing you some of the incredible detail. Um, the plum garden is just, I mean, look at this. Um, you know, the, the subtlety in the shading from the, the red sky down to the pink, down to the white, you know, that is an expert printmaker. Most of us are familiar with the Great Wave by Hokusai Hiroshi, Hiro, Hiroshiji, and I'm not, still not getting it right, and tomorrow These three artists were very famous for their prints. Um, Yutamara particularly did prints of women. This is a complicated composition. She's got two mirrors and she's looking at her hair, making sure it is arranged beautifully. Of course, this is a geisha. She's getting ready for her evening. But notice the print on the wall, you know, just all the little detail, you know, most of us don't notice Mount Fuji in the background there with the Great Wave. Um, you know, this wide variety of works. Um, when the 19th century painters, impressionists, Degas in particular, Van Gogh, Van Gogh would actually recreate and oil some of these, a uh, couple of these images. Now we're moving on to lino cut. It's made from linoleum and not not really linoleum today, but it is a similar subject. It has no grain. So unlike wood, you can cut in any direction possible. It's also much softer, but if you have a soft surface, it wears away. So it's less durable. I absolutely love this work. Um, created in 1952, but published later in 1968, 70 by Elizabeth Catlett, sharecropper. Um, I was teaching this to a group of freshmen one time and I had to define sharecropper for them. They were not familiar with the term. And I remember one young black man said, well, that's tantamount to slavery. And I said, yes, <laughs> you're right. It was a way of, uh, I mean, originally I think it was a feudal system. It was very much like the, the peasants in the feudal age. You know, you worked the land and you, a certain percentage of your crop went to your overseer, your master, um, but the person who owned the land, but they got their cut first. And if you didn't have a com good crop that year, you were in trouble. Um, then you add in the company store where, you know, oh, well, we don't have any money, but I can charge it. It became a very abusive system. I read somewhere, I think it's by uh, the 40s and 50s, 50% 50 of Southern sharecroppers were white. It was not, it was an exploitation of poor people. But I think Elizabeth Catlett really captures here just the beauty and dignity of a woman who has worked very hard She's probably actually chronologically younger than she appears. Um, you just get a sense of strength. You know, anyone who does the human figure, if they can capture that personality behind the face, I think they've achieved something tremendous. 
And this is one of my personal favorite pieces of art. And um, I hope you I hope you see the beauty in it. But see, all of many of these lines, especially these curved lines in the face, she could do because she was using um, linoleum. Um, you know, like I said, cut in any direction. Now, not as many prints can be made from this. And I guess let's talk about numbering, prints and numbering. Okay, the you'll see it like express kind of like a fraction, two over 50. That means 50 prints were made and this is the second one off the print. This, the bigger the bottom number, you know, if you've got 2,000 or maybe 10, 10 is much a, a print in, in, the, in a group of 10 is going to be um, probably, I mean, you know, whoever did it, but I remember when um, Kincaid, Thomas Kincaid was so, so, so popular, You'd look at his prints and there'd be, you know, 10,000 and this would be number 5,004. Well, the smaller the top number and the smaller the bottom number, the, the rarer your print is. And rarity is associated with value, not necessarily. There are other factors. Don't buy art because you think it's going to make money for you. Buy it because you enjoy it. And then if you make money for it, even better. Serendipity. But um, yeah, the smaller the top number, look at that first. That means which number within the printing volume. Yes, John. Um, I can't hear you, John. You John, muted. you got muted. muted. You're yeah. muted. Is there any difference between machine created prints uh, like mass production uh, versus uh, hand block prints in terms of the way they're named or noted or no. recorded? Um, you know, most people use a, a, a mechanical part. I mean, you know, very few people do it the old fashioned, you know, the way the Gutenberg would have been created or the way the Japanese prints were made um, today. But if you knew the artist did that, that might increase like I said, I don't buy art thinking you're making a valuable, you might, you might get really lucky. I mean, somebody bought the first Picasso painting and, you know, did quite well on it. Um, but you have to, um, but no, not that I know of. Um, there's, you know, the, the print, the actual mechanical process of producing the prints is actually the least important. It's the work on um, the piece of linoleum or the wood block that, that that's where the value gets and how many they create. Yes, Jackie, you have a question? Yes, I wondered if they used the, uh, did the design first on paper and glued it to the line, to the uh, linoleum like they did on the wood. You know, I, I haven't heard of that. It wouldn't, I, I, I'd be willing to bet they had worked it out on paper, you know, what they wanted to do. Because, you know, once you carve a line, you're done. You know, you can't take that back. So I suspect a lot of it had been worked out. Whether they actually put the paper on top and followed it, I, I'm not, not sure of. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm probably, yes, they had worked it out in advance. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of them did that. I think that's actually quite logical. It keeps you from, especially if you're, you know, some people work as on um, gold plate and silver plate and you know those are incredibly expensive and you don't and you make a mistake and it's forever so you yeah. have to um, keep that in mind you think about it though the, the logically if you were to take a thin paper like you talked about in the japanese mm -hmm. thing and you draw your line on it and then you turn that over and glue it to the to the deal yeah. you have now done your reversal yeah yeah you, and, you, and everything else so yeah, i'm, I'm I mean, sure they start time. with a it makes me, you know, I've actually tried to like draw a stick figure or something on the board when on a whiteboard, like when I'm teaching in a classroom and having to think about making the profile face the opposite direction of what, I mean, it is, it is a complicated, I'm sure, you know, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's intuitive, but it, it is not the easiest thing. I think, like I said, remember 
the the piece of linoleum that this print came from, this woman is facing the opposite direction. I'll bring in, I'll bring in that image next week and show you uh, when we do, you know, before we get sculpture. Yes, Jackie. Uh, do, you know, do you know the size of this work? No, I don't. I can find that out for you. Um, she's a very famous artist, uh, but I find this one very powerful. Um, yes, it's beautiful. It is. I, I just, it's just a powerful image. This is, you just see so much, I mean, dignity, I think is the word I think of. You know, she may be poor, she may work hard, she may not be well educated, but she has dignity. And Someone I, else has uh, been unmuted for a little while and is patiently waiting to ask their question. Go oh, ahead. Yes, please. I would like to go back to the linen cut by Catlett again. And I, I see that she is in making the hat. She has is, is really brought a lot to the picture just with that hat. It sets the head off. It sets the whole picture off. Yeah. yeah. And it, I just, I'm amazed at just how she uses that to, to, to make the picture even better. Yeah. Oh, and I love her hair. I mean, you know, notice the, the graying hair that tells us volumes about the woman. You know, um, I, I, like I said, I just, this is just a powerful image. I never tire of looking at it. So let's talk about intaglio. Okay, we've been talking about the raised area taking the ink. Now it is going to be the reverse. The, you incise into the plate and it's that groove that will take the ink. The ink will now, the print will be made from the, below the surface. There are several intaglio techniques Engraving, probably the most famous, is engraving and etching. There's dry point and aqua tint. So engraving is the oldest of the intaglio techniques. It's created with a burn, which is a sharp, has a very V-shaped instrument. Um, you can use it. It's very similar to, it appears both similar to pen and ink in technique and appearance. And you even hold, some people even hold the burn like a, a pen. Um, engravings were the principal way in which works of art from the Renaissance and classical antiquity were reproduced and disseminated prior to the 19th century inventions of lithography and photograph. Durer was for Albert Durer in his formative years, um, and he was creating art at 13. I mean, we have images that he created at 13. His father was a printmaker. Uh, it, it may even have been his grandfather. But anyway, he had, had the acquaintance of a gentleman of some wealth who had a collection, a portfolio of prints. And this is how he saw Michelangelo's David or Raphael's School of Athens because there were printmakers that specialized in recreating. Of course, they're in black and white. Um, the different paintings. Marco, I love this name, Marco Antonio Ramonde um, took Raphael's Judgment of Paris and created this engraving. And so you can see, even though you don't have color, you can see the composition, the, the poses, the body style, um, the subject. And um, this is from the 1500s or um, Many printmakers, many artists made their own prints, but that's time consuming. So they often had printmakers who, like Marco Antonio Ramonde, he had, um, basically this was his business. He did a lot of Raphael's and you can make multiple copies of it. Remember, that's one of the points, um, pluses, I think personally, that uh, printmaking is you can make multiple copies. So you make a hundred of these, you have a few wealthy tourists in Rome and they buy them from you, they return to London, Paris, uh, you know, up north above the Alps and people see them and appreciate them. It helps build the reputation of the Renaissance artists. So that is how um, many, many artists at first become familiar. Now, artists like Rubens in particular, Durer in particular, they would travel to Italy 
and Rome to mm -hmm. see these works mm -hmm. um, and make a study of them. Mm -hmm. Rembrandt was actually the exception to the rule. He never went to mm -hmm. Italy to study the works, the Renaissance and antiquity. Again, Sandra, we have another question. Yes. Sandra, could you go back to the, uh, the engraving? Yes. Yeah. And uh, look in the bottom right corner, and I'll let Annalise tell yeah. about it. There is there is a sitting figure that has sort of propped the arm on the knee and is looking back. Yes, yes. And that the is, figure. Yeah, that is the exact pose that uh, Manet used. Yes, yes, on. very much, very much. Yes, yes. you'll dish, find that the artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'll find these artists that traveled to Rome would make these sketches and take them home. I could show you examples if we had the time with Rubens, where he took um, poses that he sketched um, of figures, uh, classical antiquity figures that he turned into uh, Christ being crucified. I mean, there's a very famous example. So, no, yeah, it's called quoting. Um, you, you know, there's various levels of it, how much you directly copy it, how much you adjust it. Um, but yes, sharp eye, very sharp eye for that. Um, so uh, dry point. I love this work. Um, this is one of three, only three dry points ever made by Albert Durer. It's similar to engraving, except the cutting instrument is an actual, it looks very much like a sewing needle. It's not exactly, but uh, it raises very thin ridges of metal that holds the ink. Notice it's much softer, what we call softer line. You, I think you can see the difference. Here's engraving, here's dry point. Printing quickly destroys the, the burr. So there's not very many additions again. Um, so 10, 20 prints, you get number one or two, you and you get a dirt, you're doing very, very well. This is the Holy Family, um, you know, so um, Joseph over there, and it's only, he only made three, I suspect, because uh, printmaking was Durer's business. That's how he made money. Um, he preferred to paint, but, you know, what fed the family um, was printmaking, and it was the family business, and he was a master at it, I, you know, but it wasn't considered as high, you know, the best was oil painting and a certain type of paintings. Etching. Etching is done with acid. It actually eats the metal plate. So first you put down a, what's a ground on the plate and then you take your needle. So you've got this paste sitting on top of your metal plate, wax, kind of a waxy substance. You take your needle and you draw in the wax. You, you, I mean, you touch the plate, but you don't make lines on the plate. You then take the plate and place it in an acid bath and where you have removed the ground, okay, this ground protects the plate from the acid. So only where you have drawn a line through the, the ground will there be any line. And the etch lines are not as sharply as defined as lines created by engraving, but they're not as soft as dry point. So here is the 100 Gilders print by Rembrandt, so-called because that's what it was I mean, he, by this time, he was a very famous artist that he made this print. It's actually Christ preaching uh, from 1652, but it sold for 100 guilders. So um, that's why it's called the 100 guilders print. Um, I, it, which is, I'll try to remember to look it up. Someone actually converted it into 21st century money in a book I read once. And it's, it is not cheap. These prints were less expensive than paintings because there were more of them. I mean, it's it's capitalism, supply and demand, but they still, you know, the average person saved up to get one. Notice that the figures are um, both the 17th century um, Dutch clothing, the woman with her back to you in the foreground, 
and then notice some of the the elders around Christ and Christ himself are in what you know we consider biblical grounds that is very typical for Rembrandt but notice how much softer blurry you might say the lines are in etching as opposed to engraving here so it's not as you know sharp as dry point of course this is the hands in the hands of the master you know think of all those figures that composition again i'm sure he worked this out before he put it to um, the plate now aquatint is a variation on the etching process it achieves flat areas of tone gray values or intermediate values of color plates dipped in acid the resin that's on the plate determines the size of space created by the acid. Now, the difficulty, the one factor with Aquatint you have to keep in mind is it does not print lines. So you then go back, usually with dry point, and create the lines. So everywhere you see lines, the desk, the letter, the, her fingers, the, you know, on her face, all of those were created afterwards on the work. So this is Mary Cassatt's The Letter. Um, again, you can see the influence of the Japanese woodblock prints. If you look at this, the pattern, you know, and there's just not a real strong sense of recession, you know, that you, you're not quite sure how far back that wall is from the figure. So lithography, another Elizabeth Catlett work just love her work first drawn upon stone that has a greasy material on it and it's a complicated process and for our purposes i just don't really want to get into the details you can look it up on the internet and read step by step if you wish it's a series of procedures including an acid bath which fixes the image to print you then dampen the stone with water it soaks into the area not co coated with the greasy substance. So the print areas are inked and the greasy areas are printed. Um, singing their songs, 1992, uh, color lithograph. Notice the image, the blue square, those are uh, slaves. They've got collars around their necks. Their mouths are open. Um, Notice, I mean, the African-American heritage of the church music, you get that sense with the prayer, but, um, you know, this is, you know, not all songs are happy songs. So, screen printing. This is the standard station from 1966. You know, silk screen, most of us think of it as t-shirts. So, working, you work from drawings, uh, you block out areas on the screen, that are not meant to be printed. So the holes are where the ink goes through and creates the print. Um, we've got a, we're kind of running low on time, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly through these if you have any questions. A lot of people are more familiar with screen printing. Um, it's placed over paper and ink. The ink is first through. One screen is just like color block printing, one screen is prepared for each color. So this is pretty complicated if you look at the sky and the graduation of colors. But there's these very sharp lines. This is the 1960s, the interstate system, you know, the cars, you know, gas was a quarter and they gave you a gift and washed your windshield and checked your oil y'all and pumped your gas. Y'all remember, does anyone remember that besides me? Um, not today. <laughs> And we travel, you know, the vacations with the station wagons. It's a time that really is not, not going to come again in a way. Um, last one we're going to talk about. Here's the exception to the rule. I said prints make multiple images. Well, not a monotype. A monotype is produced only a single print is made. The artist creates the work runs it through a press, transfers the image, and then destroys the original plate. So there can be no duplicate impressions made. So um, that is the exception to the rule with prints. 
it's a relatively modern technique, you know, modern idea. Most prints were made, especially in the beginning, with the idea of producing multiple copies. So, okay, next week we will talk about sculpture. Any questions on this lecture? Y'all are always a great audience. So, and I enjoy your questions. So, anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Thank you for uh, going. On the etchings, uh, and uh, there was another one following, I think, Aqua Tent. Uh, you did not say how many times you could get a print from an acid etch etching. Multiple. I mean, it, you know, it, it is not like wood cut. It, they don't wear out. They're metal plates. So, okay. you know, they're metal plates. You're working on a metal plate. Now you put the, the it's usually a waxy substance that goes over it. So it's easy to cut through make the lines but remember the acid will then eat into the metal plate that's exposed so, okay it's basically permanent yeah okay the use of jelly uh jelly presses um i will bring that i, I will answer that next week I, I did not cover it in this lecture but i can if you wish so um, i take it that's a technique you're interested in bernadette is she nodding yes or saying yes? Okay. <laughs> uh, I will look it up and bring it to you. It's not something I'm readily familiar with, to be perfectly honest. I was just trying to, these are the main, there's many other prints. There's mesotints. I, I tried to hit the highlights, the most common ones, because, you know, we have a finite amount of time. And uh, so, okay. Anyone else with a question or comment? Um, so. As I said, it's always nice. I, um, when you first start out teaching or giving lectures, you're always terrified of questions. And but I, one of my professors said to me, "It means they paid attention. <laughs> you know, it, you know, they're not the students sleeping in the back of the room. Don't ask you questions. That's true. Right. And life life questers usually ask oh, no, really good it, questions. It, <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's I, I tell everyone that I when I talk to them about maybe teaching here, I always say. This is not like teaching a, a, a college class where you have some interested students and some that, you know, they're just killing time. I said, everybody here is because they're interested. They bring a great deal of knowledge to the subject and you will have questions that will stump you, which is great. So, it helps us all learn. Yes. I mean, I mean, I'm a lifelong learner. It isn't that what LifeQuest is really all about. That is exactly what we're about. So. And we look forward to our fourth week with you next week and learning more. Um, if you all are in the mood, we have Tai Chi starting in about 12 minutes. So you have time to switch over to the other class and start doing some stretches. Um, but thank you, Sandra, for today and printing. And it was all very fascinating. So I'm going to stop and recording. Thank you, Gina. Thank, thank you. <laughs> so. All righty, then I'll leave you and I'll see you next Thursday. It will be our last day of class. So, and it'll be, I, I turn a year older the next day. So I'm not going to tell you my age, but I have a birthday on the 31st. So I'll see you the last day of my year. So anyway, okay. take care, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Pleasure as always. <laughs>